Here's a last-minute Christmas shopping suggestion. Jingle bells, jingle bells, bells of NBC. Oh, what joy to cook and bake while listening merrily. Pots and pans, sink and stove, work goes easily. Kitchens ring with happy chimes when tuned to NBC. What will you hear in your kitchen after Christmas? Bacon sizzling, coffee perking, dishes clinking, and, if you're lucky, a new sound. NBC Radio listening on that new set. The perfect gift to lighten mother's long hours in the kitchen. Kitchens ring with happy chimes when tuned to NBC. James Stewart as the six shooter. The man in the saddle is angular and long legged. His skin is sun-dyed brown. The gun in his holster is gray steel and rainbow mother of pearl, its handle unmarked. People call them both the six-shooter. The NBC Radio Network presents James Stewart as the six-shooter, a transcribed series of radio dramas based on the life of Britt Ponsett, the Texas plainsman, who wandered through the Western territories, leaving behind a trail of still-remembered legends. There was a nip in the air, not a freezing, biting, angry nip, but a sort of tingle that made the morning stars shimmer and swung them out of their orbits a little closer to the Earth. Oh, it was a winter nip, all right, but not a hard winter. Not a winter when the cattle would come down from the high places, poking their noses into the ice-encrusted ground. It was a mild winter nip. Mild enough so that the breath of the boy on the pinto turned only a faint gray as he rode toward the campfire where the man was sitting. Howdy. Hello, mister. I see your fire. I, I thought maybe you wouldn't mind if I gave my pony a chance to warm up. Sure, sure. Make yourself home. You heading for Thompson's Corners, mister? That's right. I just came from there. Oh, well, you must have been riding all night. Oh, just about. You see, uh, I'm running away from home. Oh, that's so. Ah. Seems kind of a funny thing you'd pick this time of year to run away. Uh, so close to Christmas, I mean. I hate Christmas. Oh? It, it's just for kids, anyhow. Well... I, I heard Aunt Louie say so. Christmas is for children. That's what she said. Johnny's old enough to do with all, all that fuss and nonsense. I heard her tell Mr. Franklin that. Oh, you don't live with your folks, huh, Johnny? No, sir. He, he died about eight months ago. Oh, I see. Christmas was all right when they... When I was with them. Of course, I was a lot younger then. Oh, yes, yes. yes it yes. just beats me the way folks take Christmas so serious. Well, I don't know. Is it getting presents made any difference? As if I really cared about that knife. Why, is that what you wanted, a, a pocket knife? I don't want a knife. I don't want anything. I just wish there wasn't any Christmas, that's all. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I guess you aren't the first person to feel that way. You know, it seems to me... It seems to me I remember reading a story once about a fellow felt the same way about Christmas you do. Just didn't have any use for it. What happened to you? Well, I, I doubt if I can call it to mind after all this time, but as I recollect... Now, now mind you, this may not be word for word, uh, but as I recollect, the man that it was about, the one that hated Christmas, that is, well, he he was a real skin plant, he was. He, just as stingy as they come. Yeah, uh, his name was, uh, let me see, was Eben, something like that. Eben? Eben, yeah, I, I, I'm pretty sure that was it. Well... Being so tight-fisted, this fellow Eben, he he got to be the richest man in the whole territory. He owned a ranch? Oh, sure, sure. Had, had four of them. Four ranches and store buildings and farms and maybe a bank or two. He was rich. I bet he had a mighty fine ranch house. No. No, no, he didn't have a ranch house. He, Eben wasn't the sort to spend money on a ranch house unless there was profit in it. See, he just lived alone in town, had himself a steady room at the hotel. Well, anyway, one night while Evan was sitting in his room having supper, Christmas Eve it was, well, on this particular Christmas Eve, 
His only kin, a nephew, lived in the same town. He, he stopped by the hotel. To wish you a Merry Christmas, Uncle, and invite you to our place for dinner tomorrow. Christmas. Fiddlesticks. Powder I suppose you'd be closing up your livery stable for the occasion. Why, sure, Uncle Eb. And just how are the horses know it's Christmas? Answer me that. <laughs> well, if they don't know it, we will. Can I tell Sally to expect you at three? You can expect me all you like, but I ain't coming. Not at three or any other time. Oh, if you're making so much money, you can afford to be giving parties. Maybe I ought to think about raising the rents on the livery stable. Well, now, Uncle Oh, go on, get out of here before I lose my temper. All this nonsense about Christmas. Fiddlesticks. Hold it. Well, after that, Johnny, the nephew didn't stick around there. He got out of Evans' hotel room in a regular gallop. I wasn't very long before Evan had another visitor. He was a young fellow, tall, lanky, not very good at speaking. He just plain ordinary cowpoke. He was the foreman of the S&M ranch. Oh, well, it took you long enough to get here. Where have you been? Selling off some of my herd without telling me about it? No, sir. That day you rode by, I was out in the range hunting stray. And a good thing I decided to check up on you, too. What's that cabin doing over by Holly Creek? And who are those people staying here? They're my family. I, I built the shack for them myself. I'm not going to have a bunch of nesters in my property. Tear it down. But well, one of my boys has been sick. I, I can't afford That's to rent it. That's my concern. It's up to you to keep your family and what you earn. So see that you get rid of that shack tomorrow. But tomorrow's Christmas. Oh, oh, well. Then you'll have plenty of free time to tear it down. I'll be out the day after to make sure you've done it. Good night. I wasn't much use in argument. Form knew that. So he put on his hat and shuffled out. Now Evan was alone again. At least he thought he was alone. The clock on the mantel started striking eight, and that's the time for him to turn in. So he put on his flannel nightshirt and reached for the kerosene lamp to set it on the stool beside the bed. And, and right about then, the strangest thing happened. It went... What in tarnish? Johnny, old Eben saw a man's face looking right at him from inside that lamp. Eyes and hair and nose and mouth, whiskers, all, all just as plain as day. Jake! It was old Jake, Evan's partner. There wasn't any mistake about it at all. It was Jake right to a T. Well, Evan sure didn't like the idea of having Jake right in the same room with him. You see, Jake had been dead for over seven years. Not that Evan really believed in ghosts or haunts or anything like that. He told himself he was just imagining all this. Yeah, I, 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 I got to get a hold of myself. He... he put out his hand to turn down the wick, but all of a sudden his fingers started trembling. There was Jake again, across the room this time, standing right by the bureau. No! And when the lamp slipped out of Evan's hand, the, the room didn't get dark at all. Jake seemed to be surrounded by a splotch of bright yellow light, and he was wearing the same boots and breeches and leather jacket that he'd had on seven years ago, the, the day died. But as Jake came closer, Evan could see that he was wearing something else. A small leather saddle strapped across his back. And hanging down from it were two saddlebags stuffed so full of gold nuggets and mortgage papers and land grants that Jake could hardly drag him across the floor. You recognize me, Evan? Oh, sure, Jake. Why, sure. I'd never forget you, but... Well, what are you doing here? <laughs> and why are you wearing that get-up? Always thinking about land and money. Always scheming and conniving. That's why I wear it. And that's why I've come to warn you, Evan. The saddle you're fixing up for yourself is even heavier than mine. But I don't know what you mean, Jake. I ain't done no wrong. I ain't never done folks no wrong. Have you ever done them any good? Any good at all? Oh, why, sure. I've worked hard. I've saved my money. I ain't been a burden on anybody. Why, well, you should see our ranches, Jake. Oh, the way I've built them up. I have seen them many times. And I've seen a lot more than that, too. That's my punishment. To spend eternity traveling around, seeing mankind with its trials and tribulations, with its joys and hopes. Is that so terrible? Oh, Evan, to watch them and not be able to help them. You'll find out how terrible it is. 
You'll find out. Well, there must be some way of avoiding this. Uh, you always were, my friend. Uh, Jake, tell me what to do. Evan, you've got to find out for yourself. But how? Tonight, at one o'clock, you'll be haunted by a ghost. Another ghost? Pay him heed, Evan. Pay him some heed. Hey, hey, wait, Jake. Don't leave me without... Uh, 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 Jake. The yellow light sort of faded away and the ghost was gone. It was just like he hadn't even been there. And then... And then something caught the corner of Evan's eye. A little glimmer on the floor. And he bent over to pick it up. A gold nugget. Now where on earth did he... And then he remembered. Those saddlebags of Jake's They'd been filled clear to the brim with gold nuggets. We're interrupting our story for only a moment, and only to tell you, our unseen audience, that you have helped more than you may realize to make this a very Merry Christmas for all of us on this program. Your being with us each week, your many kind letters have told us that all the work that goes into bringing you the six-shooter has not been in vain, and we're grateful. So, friends, from all of us, Jimmy Stewart and the cast, our writer, our director, engineers, and sound technicians, our best wishes for a happy holiday season. Oh, yes, and before I forget it, beginning December 31st, the six-shooter will be on the air on Thursdays instead of Sundays. That's beginning Thursday the 31st. The time of broadcast will be listed in your local newspaper. Thank you. Now, Act Two of The Six Shooter, starring James Stewart as Britt Ponson. Gee, with a gold nugget. Then Jake's ghost really had been there, mister? Yeah, there just wasn't any doubt about it, Johnny. Well, what happened then? Did the other spook turn up? The one Jake said was coming to see Evan? Oh, sure, Johnny, sure, yeah. And he was right on time, too. Evan was lying in bed, wide awake, of course. He hadn't been able to do much sleep, and he's too scared. You know? it, it was kind of peculiar. Evan was half scared the ghost would come and half scared he wouldn't, you see. But before the sound of the clock had died away... There he was. He's sitting in Evan's rocking chair like he'd been there all night long. And and this ghost was a was a young fella. Oh, maybe 18, 19. All dooted up the way young bucks like to dress. You know, fancy shaps and checkered shirt and a red bandana tied around his neck. Howdy, Evan. Reckon you've been expecting me. Here, yeah, well, I... I... I guess so. You ready to take a little trip? With you. Way back through the years. Oh, but how can I go with It's real easy. You see, I'm the ghost of Christmas past. Your past, Evan. Let's shove on. Well, the next thing Evan knew, he and that ghost were standing out on a snow-covered prairie. There was a circle of covered wagons in front of them, and the people from the wagons were gathered together and listening to a tall, Stand white-bearded man. Behold, he was reading the Bible. Great joy, which will beat all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto and you. you shall find the baby. The ghost turned and water. pointed to a boy sitting away from the others on the tailboard of one of the wagons. Small boy, all oh, about ten years old, with hollow cheeks and his eyes all red from crying. Oh, oh no. It was it was Evan himself. On a Christmas day, a long, long time ago. Not a very happy Christmas, either. It was only a week since the oxen had stampeded and his ma had been killed when she, she fell from the wagon. His pa had died with an Apache arrow in his chest. No, I, I don't want to look at him anymore. Can't you show me another Christmas? Well, it was no sooner said than done. Now, Evan and the ghost were in a bunkhouse. And Evan saw himself again. Oh, he's ten years older than the boy on the prairie, but he was lying on a blanket staring up at the ceiling. And then his pal Jake came running in, all out of breath. Come on, Ed. Get a clean shirt on. We got us an invite to a party. Huh? 
Yeah, the boss is throwing a big shindig. He says he'll fire us if we don't show up. Evan couldn't help remembering that party. Oh, the roast beef and the baked ham and square dancing and the pretty girls in their calico. He couldn't help saying out loud to the ghost. Oh, dear. How I wish I... What was that, Evan? Nothing, Mr. Spirit. Nothing, I... I was just remembering how I treated my foreman today. That's all. After that, the ghost took Evan to three or four more of his old Christmases. And none of them were very happy. Especially that Christmas when the young school marm, sitting on the horsehair sofa, had unwrapped the tiny box Evan gave her and then handed it back to him. It's a lovely ring, Evan. But I can't wear it. Well, you're, you're not caught in somebody else. No, Evan. But you are. You're caught in something else. Bill. Land and money, cattle, profits. They mean more to you than I ever would. I'm sorry. Mr. Ghost, no more of the past. Please, I've seen enough. A man wants to forget. Sure, Evan, whatever you say. And before Evan could blink his eyes, he was right back in the hotel room. But once he got there, he he blinked real hard because all of a sudden the ghost was becoming a different person. He was getting fatter, and his stomach popped out two or three inches, and a few wrinkles creased his cheeks, and finally his chaps turned into a shiny blue serge suit with a heavy gold chain dangling across the vest. Hey, well, what's happened to you? Why are you so different now? You seem to be getting tired of the past, so I thought we might take a gander at the present. If you've got no objection. Well, the hotel room just melted away, and Evan was looking at that cabin his foreman had built on Holly Creek. <laughs> well, that cabin sure was crowded. Oh, there must have been five or six children, all helping their mother get the Christmas dinner, all laughing and talking, as busy as summer coats. But when their father came in, he had a long face and a tired mouth, and... His wife looked up and wanted to know what was troubling him. Oh, I was just thinking about old Evan. <laughs> That's not a very pleasant thought for Christmas, Bob. Um, by the way, what did he want with you yesterday? Was it about this cabin? Hmm? Yeah. Oh, no, no, of course not. Well, let's get on with dinner. Sit down, everybody. Now, where's my gym, huh? Well, I guess we're just going to have to eat And Bob something. looked all around the room. He, he was pre- pretending he didn't see the little fellow in the corner. The boy with an iron brace on his leg and a wooden crutch propped up against the wall. But little Tim, he wasn't going to be ignored. Here I am. So Bob picked him up and carried him over to the table. God bless this food, this house, and us and our friends. Even old Evan. Amen. <laughs> they... Uh... The family found that part about Evan a little hard to swallow, but they finally managed, and Tim was the last one to chime in. God bless us, everyone. (laughs) Evan didn't want to watch what was going on in that cabin any longer, but the next place the ghost showed him wasn't much easier on him. There was a big party going on at his nephew's house (laughs) back in the livery stable. And one of the ladies was blindfolded, you see, and, and she was trying to pin the tail onto a donkey. But, but there was something peculiar about this donkey, about the way it, about the way it was drawn. It, it, it looked more like a person than an animal. Well, Eben recognized who it was supposed to be right off. <laughs> you see, folks, I invited Uncle Eben to be with us, but he turned me down flat. So I figured we'd have him here in spirit, if not in the flesh. <laughs> Right back in the hotel room again. That's where Evan found himself. Spirit. Spirit, you showed me the past and the present. What's left to see? The future, Evan. The future. And that's how Evan came to see a Christmas of the future. A cold, brittle Christmas. And there were two men standing on a street corner and the coat collars turned up so that keep out the snow. Oh, he's dead all right. This is a doornail. 
Sure is a Christmas present I never expected. At least whoever handles his property won't be as hard to deal with as he was. Wonder if they'll bother giving him a funeral. And in a frame house over on the side street in the edge of town, a woman was speaking to her husband. Funny. To me, he's been dead for years. I haven't even thought of him since I don't know when. And yet, you know, once, well, once I was real fond of him. Funny, isn't it? Ghost! Who are they talking about? Those men on the street. That woman I used to know. Who is it that's dead? Tell me. And the ghost slowly turned and stretched out a long, thin, bony finger. And there... Right at the end of that finger was a tombstone, all covered with weeds. Eben could barely make out the name that was carved on it. Ebenezer Scrooge. No. No, no! Uh, uh, What's this? Uh, Where am I? You know what? He was right in his own bed, in his own nightshirt. And the sun was streaming through the frosted windows. But Evan didn't stay there very long, not for very long. He got into his boots and trousers as fast as he could, and he dashed down the stairs, out into the street. Well, you see, the stores being closed gave Evan quite a problem. Well, he, he'd just have to make Fuzzy Wagner open the butcher shop up, that's all. Of course, Fuzzy didn't have much choice, seeing as how the shop was located in one of Evan's buildings. And when Evan told him what he wanted... A turkey and a ham. Well, no, 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 no. I'd better make it two hams and send them out to the cabin on the S and M ranch. <laughs> and they're not to know that I ordered them. You understand, Fuzzy? Here's the money and a little extra for your trouble. Well, before Fuzzy could get his jaw shut up again, Evan was on his way, and he headed right straight out to his nephew's house. And Evan was the life of the party too. Well, the way he carried on, he's laughing and making jokes and telling stories on himself and. He insisted that they use that donkey with his face on it when they play games, you know. Because that's what I've been all these years. A real four-footed, long-eared donkey. (laughs) The next morning, though, that's that's what Eben enjoyed the most. He was up bright and early and hitched the team to the buckboard and drove out to the S&M, hurrying the horses all the way. Come on, Bess! Come on, Martha! Uh, step a little lightly. If he could just get out there before his foreman start tearing down that cabin. Whoa, whoa, my head. Whoa, whoa. Yeah. Mm. Well, Robert? Yes, sir? I see you ain't carried out my orders. Well, it was Christmas. I, I just couldn't tell him I'll do it today. Oh, this is the last straw. I'm not putting up with your shenanigans any longer, young fellow. But please, that don't... cabin's coming down and no buts about it. And then, uh, and then we're building a new ranch house in this place. Big enough for you and your whole family. What? Oh, yes. I'm also doubling your wages as of last week. <laughs> Merry Christmas, Bob. Even if I am a day late. No, not a day. More like half a lifetime. But Merry Christmas anyway, and and as your son says, God bless us, everyone. Well, that's the way things worked out, Johnny, more or less. Well, that's a fine story, Mr. Real fine. I reckon I know why you told it to me. How's that? So as I'd understand about Christmas and how important it is to do for other people... Instead of just thinking about yourself. Well, no, no, I, I didn't have that in mind especially. The story just happened to come into my head. That's all. I was... well, maybe if I had to give Aunt Millie something, a present, maybe. Oh, shucks! What could I give her? I don't have no money. Well, of course, there are lots of things that don't cost a penny. Not a single red cent, you know. Hmm? Well, now you, let's see. Take that little spruce over there. I'd be real easy to cut that down with a little fixin' and maybe a few doodads from around the house. I, well, I'll bet you can make a Jim Dandy Christmas tree out of that. I suppose so, but what good's a tree without something to put under it? Oh, yes, yeah, I see what you mean. Uh, Johnny, 
Uh, you don't happen to know Jim Bender, do you? And Thompson's Corner and his three daughters? He's only got two, Mr. Sarah and Emily. Oh, that's all. That's so. I, I was spending Christmas with them. I, hmm. Uh, it looks like I'm carrying an extra present. It's a real pretty little red bonnet with feathers on it. I couldn't take it, mister. Oh, no, no. I, I wasn't thinking of giving it to you, Johnny. I, but I was sort of hoping that you'd show me the trail from here on in. Of course, it would mean you're turning around going back home, but if I was to cause you changing your plans, I'd feel obligated to pay you back some way, you know. Well, I... It would be only fair. Trouble is, I haven't got much money, so... If you wouldn't mind accepting the bonnet instead, you'd be doing me a real favor, Johnny. I... There's Aunt Millie out in the yard. Oh, she, she looks mad in a wet hand. Well, there is a resemblance. I'll have to admit that. Where in tarnation have you been, John Carville? I've been looking high and low for you since dawn. Well, I, I just went for a little ride, Aunt Millie. To get us a Christmas tree, see? Christmas tree? Fiddlesticks. <laughs> this gentleman won't me cut it down. I'll just take it inside. Be right back, mister. <laughs> if we had any use for a Christmas tree. I suppose he's figuring there'll be a whole lot of presents under it. No, no, I don't think so. But uh, just between you and me, I, I got a hunch there'll be at least one person waiting for somebody. What are you talking about? Oh, no, no. It wouldn't be fair for me to speak out before Christmas. You know that. You... You don't mean he's got something for me. No, no, no. You must get too curious so early. But... But I thought he didn't like me. I thought he just hated having to live here with... with an old maid. I guess I just don't know nothing about kids. Nothing at all. I... I don't deserve to get... Well, uh, <clears throat> I, uh, I think I'd better get moving along. I, say goodbye to Johnny for him, will you? And uh, I wonder if you'd uh, give this to him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, uh, tell him the little blade on it's kind of dull, but... A uh, pocket knife? Yeah. Now, how did you know? Hold on. Man. Oh, God bless you, mister. And Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Remember now, beginning December 31st, the Six Shooter will be on Thursdays instead of Sundays. We hope you'll join us in our new time. The Six Shooter is an NBC Radio Network production in association with Review Productions. The transcribed story was written by Frank Burt in collaboration with Charles Dickens. Mr. Stewart may soon be seen in the Universal International picture, The Glenn Miller Story. Howard McNear played Scrooge, and special music was by Basil Adlam. The entire production is under the direction of Jack Johnstone. All characters and incidents were fictitious, and any resemblance to actual characters or incidents is purely coincidental. And now, until Thursday the 31st, this is Hal Gibney speaking. Merry Christmas. Hear Rex Harrison and Anna Lee in the NBC Star Playhouse on the NBC Radio Network.